All right, Numbers chapter 16. Now, we're going to read a story here that you've probably read before and heard about, and it's a tragic story. We're just going to read it. Uh, this story goes all the way through this chapter, but for time's sake, we just don't have time to read every bit of it, the whole entire chapter. It's about, I think, about 50 verses long. Uh, I think, yeah, 50 verses. And to read this story where these people were swallowed up uh, into a pit. The earth opened up. And we're going to read the circumstances of what happened here. And uh, this is the sixth murmuring of the children of Israel. The sixth time they murmured and complained. All right, look at chapter number 16, number 16, verse 1. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. I believe that's when the first committee was formed. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, You take, you take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. And he spake unto Korah, even in all, unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his, and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even whom, him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. This do, take ye censers, Korah, and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord, hath cho the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. You take too much upon ye, you sons of Levi. And Moses said unto Korah, Here I pray you, you sons of Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you, that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. And he hath brought thee near to him, and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee, and seek ye the priesthood also, for which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against, against the Lord. Now notice, they complained against Moses, but the complaints against the Lord. Amen. You complain against that office. And what is Aaron that you murmur against him? Moses said to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Elab, which said, Will we will not come up. Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of the land that floweth with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us? Moreover, thou hast not brought us into a land that floweth with milk and honey or given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Wilt thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. You're taking too long, preacher. I thought you said we was going to go to a land of milk and honey. We ain't got nowhere. So we're taking over. Amen? And the Bible said... Moses was very wroth and said unto the Lord, Respect not thou their offering. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. And Moses said to Korah, Be thou and all thy company before the Lord, thou and they and Aaron tomorrow, and take every man his censer and put incense in them, and bring you before the Lord every man his censer, two hundred and fifty censers, and thou also and Aaron, each of, each of you his censer. Now we're going to jump right down just a little bit to verse number... 23, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speaking to the congregation, saying, Get ye up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and uh, the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side, and Dathan and Abiram came out. And stood in the door of their tents and their wives and their sons. Now I know I'm reading a lot, but watch this real close. They brought all their family, their wives and their kids and everybody, and brought them out there. And their little children. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own mind. If these men die in the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. If they die a natural death, then the Lord didn't send me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all that are appertaining to them, and they go down quick into the pit, then you shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. 
And it came to pass as he had made an end of speaking all these words that the ground clave was under, that was under them, and the earth opened their mouth and swallowed them up in their houses. And all the men that are appertained unto Korah and all their goods, they and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel were round about that fled at the cry of them, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. Amen. Let's go to chapter number 26. I want to read you one more verse. Chapter number 26. Chapter number 26 and verse 7. Now we just read that the earth opened up and swallowed these people up for rebelling against God and rebelling against His man. Uh, chapter number 26. I believe it's verse number 7. Now look at this. These are the they're numbering. They're numbering the people. Here they're numbering the people. These are the families of the Reubenites, and they that were numbered of them were forty and three thousand and seven hundred and thirty. And the sons of Palu and Eliab, and the sons of Eliab, Lemuel and Dathan. There's Dathan and Abiram. Okay, this is that Dathan and Abiram which were famous in the congregation, who strove against Moses and against Aaron in the company of Korah when they strove against the Lord. And the earth opened their mouth and swallowed them up together with Korah when that company died what time the fire devoured 250 men and they became a sign. Now here's what I want to preach from. I read a lot, but it ain't going to kill us. Read the Bible. Verse number 11 said, Notwithstanding, the children of Korah died not. There was three men that came up. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. They formed themselves a committee. Had 250 famous men that got together and went to Moses. And for some reason... You read there, we read where they brought them into the tents, the uh, door of their tents, and withstood Moses when they had this big showdown. And the Bible said they were all, that they all perished. But there's a little clause here, if you read on over into chapter 26, that everybody of those three men died, but for some reason, the Bible said the sons of Korah died not. Their children didn't die. And Here's what I want to preach about this morning for a few minutes is breaking the cycle of sin. These were men of renown, notoriety. The Bible said so. They were princes. They were men of position. But they were operating under the arm of the flesh. They went before the man of God. They said, look here. Uh, we, we've been thinking this thing over and, and you act like a dictator. And you're, you know, that's a compliment when people say that about a preacher, really. I know some preachers go overboard with that, but it's a compliment when people say that because they're complaining because they can't run things. They want to be the boss, so they call a preacher a dictator. All that means most of the time is that the preacher has strong leadership and a backbone and the people know uh, they got a good leader and they follow him and they love him and they respect him. That's all that means. When people say that, they have a rebellious agenda. They have a, they have a bad attitude toward leadership. It's always rebellion and sinful when people fight against authority. A, a church with a pastoral leadership always has the blessing of God on it. You mark that down somewhere in the margin of your Bible. Every church you ever see that God's blessing, God's pleased with, is a church that has a pastor that is in charge. He is the leader. That's biblical. Listen, I'm not saying the pastor has to do everything in the church, but he does have to oversee everything in the church. Amen. There cannot be two heads. Anything that's got two heads is a freak and it's in a carnival. Hey, man, brother, hey, but yeah, at your house, you're, you've only got one boss at your house. You might think you're co-equal uh, and you might think everything's 50-50, but you're crazy as a bed bug. I mean, because when something happens and it comes down to making a final decision, one of you is going to have to give in and let the other be boss. Am I right? That's absolute truth. Every, every in, the, in the animal kingdom, there's always a pack leader and a herd leader. There's a leader. There's a pecking order. There's always a boss in every herd and every pack. It's the same way in a church, in a business, in a family. You might as well get that through your head. And the sooner you find that out, the better off you're going to be. And the Bible said that Moses' heart was broken. He didn't like what was happening. And as soon as it took place, he fell on his face and began to plead to God and to pray and seek leadership and to seek uh, God's blessing and what God wanted him to do. And so 
God instructed Moses and Aaron to get away from the people so he could kill them. But this time he didn't wait for Moses to beg. And the Bible said, if you read on a little further, that the plague came into the camp camp and killed over 14,000 people. Now I want to tell you, the plague stopped. God will judge rebellion against authority. Every time of ever... And I, listen, I'm not necessarily talking about me. I'm talking about any preacher, any pastor, in any church, in any community, in any state, anywhere around the world. Listen, God has a divine order and God sets it up that way. Amen. And so these people, we're fighting against God. It's always wrong to go against authority. Now, there was a lot of innocent people that died. But I want you to notice in Isaiah 13, 15, it says, Everyone that is found shall be thrust through, and everyone that is joined to him shall fall by the sword. Hey, kids, if you run around with a bad crowd, you're going to the same jail. You say, well, I ain't no drug dealer. You tell that to the cops when they pull over the driver. Hey, I know people's in prison today. That was driving the car and they wasn't doing anything wrong and the drug dealer happened to be in the car and they went down too. You're guilty by association. And the Bible said if you hang around a crowd that's rebelling against the preacher, the judgment of God will be on them and it'll be on you. Hey brother, I don't want that on me for nothing. Hey, I've seen preachers doing things that wasn't right. I know preachers now that's doing things that's not right. I ain't spreading it around. I ain't trying to hurt them. I'll stay out of God's business. I'm not going to try to straighten out God's man because you'll get in the way of God and judgment will surely fall. The Bible said they got up. They were showing a united front. But Korah's children somehow escaped. They escaped death. They survived. They survived that. Why did they survive? Well, here's what I think happened. The Bible don't tell us. Nobody knows. But I believe it was like this. I believe that every once in a while you see somebody that's got some guts and some backbone and they'll stand up for what's right no matter what. You've heard this saying, blood is thicker than water. That's true. That is exactly right. Blood's thicker than water. You'll stick with your family over anybody else. Everybody does. That. I mean, I've seen people go to go to the courtroom knowing that their son had committed a crime and sat there. He's innocent. He's innocent. No, and he's guilty. A blood sticker in water. But let me tell you something this morning, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes down to right and wrong, when it comes to that Bible, when it comes to righteousness and God and the will of God, you better side on the what's right. You better side with the truth. You better take sides with God and do what's right, even if it splits you. And and some of your family members, blood is thicker than water. But somehow the children of Korah, they said, no, we're not going to go along with that. I can hear them saying, Daddy, I don't believe that's right. They may have been teenage boys. They may have been fully grown and had families of their own. And they said, Daddy, we love you. We respect you. We follow you. But this ain't right what you're doing. And they bowed out and they saved themselves. Listen, God always, God always blesses people that try to stay on the side of right. I want to say number one, sin does not have to be infectious. They kept themselves from the infection of family sin and rebellion. They wouldn't join in the sin uh, with the sin of their own father. Amen. Listen. The Bible said in Matthew 12, Jesus said, He said, Whosoever should do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my brother and my sister and my mother. They said, your, your brethren and your mama's outside. And He said, Listen, when it comes to the will of God, He said, Those that do my will, they are my family. I want to tell you something this morning. You know this is the truth. You know what I'm going to say is absolute truth. I've got family that's got the same blood flowing through their veins as I do. And we hardly ever speak. I love them. They love me. We don't hate each other. We're not in a feud, but this is my family right here. Amen. God's people is my family. Did you know the Word of God will divide people? Hey, I want to tell you something, brother. If you're serving God and completely and wholly sold out to God, listen, it will cause a division somewhere down the line with you and your family. Amen. That's right. First Timothy 5.22 said, Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partakers of other man's sins. 
Keep thyself pure. Hey, you stick with your family and you stay with what's right. When somebody starts doing something you know is wrong, you back away from it. This is as far as we go. This is where we part ways. And I believe in boys. I believe his sons probably said, Daddy, we just can't go along with that. You're getting ready to go up against Moses. And we believe God's hands on him. He brought us out of Egypt, brought us out of bondage. And we're here now. God's delivered us, Daddy. And God's promised us a land with milk and honey. We don't want to do what you're doing. And I believe they took a stand. And I believe they stood again. Listen, it's possible to break the cycle of sin. You might be here this morning and say, Preacher, everybody in my family has been sinners. My daddy was a sinner. Mom's a sinner. Daddy's a drunk. Mom's a drunk. I'm just destined to be a drunk. That's not true. Hey, you can break that cycle. You can do that this morning. Hey, you don't have to be. Some of the best preacher friends I've got came from drunkards' homes. I mean, some of them grew up on the bus route, riding the church on the bus. I want to tell you something this morning. You can break that cycle. You're not doomed and destined to do what everybody else has done. They wouldn't follow their father in rebellion. Somebody had to stand up and start. And somebody had to stand against sin in a new generation. We've got a new generation now. This generation is different from any we've ever, we've ever seen. Some of you young people here this morning that saved and loved God. Listen, it's time for you to take a stand and just live right. It don't matter how corny and odd it looks. Hey, it's always looked odd to the world. They've always thought we're square and we're weird. You're peculiar, y'all oddballs. They've always laughed at us. I've had people make fun of me right to my face. I've had it done many a time. I'm going to tell you something Jesus said then. He said, they hated me, so they're going to hate you too. You're not going to be popular. You just take a stand. Hey, listen, sin does not have to be an infectious thing. Listen, you don't have to... In, uh, you don't have to... Uh, I'll catch it from somebody else. Listen, I've watched it over the years. I've seen bad women. I've seen bad, I've been talking about bad women that sleep around and mess around like that. And as soon as they start having kids, their little girl grows up and bam, she starts doing the same thing. I've seen men that's drunks and dope addicts and you've seen it too. And they have kids and then boys grow up and they start becoming abusive just like daddy. You see a man that slaps his wife around, his son will grow up, he'll disrespect women. He'll treat his wife wrong, treat his girlfriend wrong. Listen, that's just the way it is. But I'm here to tell you that this morning, there can be an exception in your case. You don't have to live like that. You don't have to catch that infection of sin just because you're born and raised in it. These, these people, these kids, they were the only ones that escaped it. And I believe it's because they took a stand and said, I don't want to be a part of that. Amen. Number two, sin does not have to be inherited. I've seen daddies that were drunks and they're young and their sons follow them. And it's possible to, to break the chain of sin. Kids learn from their parents. I've seen kids hate the preacher and don't even know why they hate him. Wake up now, I'm preaching. I remember we had a little girl at our church one time and I pastored in South Carolina and she was a weird acting little girl and she was about 10 or 12 years old. She would practically grown up in that church but her mom and daddy was real weird. That's oddball. I mean, and, and that's okay. We're all weird. I'm a little crazy. I mean, I do some stupid crazy things myself. But listen, her mom and daddy got on the outs with me over something and they quit coming to church. They just didn't like old time preaching and standard and just hearing it straight down the line. They said they did but when it come right down to it, that's like the children of Israel. We get this manna every day and it's just plain. It ain't got no flavor to it, so they quit. Well, the little girl kept coming to church with somebody else. This other lady brought all of her kids, and she had a whole look like, like a brood of chickens she come in with, and she had a, a her husband didn't come that much. She came all the time, and that little girl came with them. And I noticed that little girl acted weird. I know she acted funny. Didn't want to speak to me. You remember that? I remember one day she come through there. I was shaking hands, shaking hands. Everybody, she'd get to me, and she'd do like that. And finally one day, it hit me wrong. I'm still human, you know, and I'm still redneck. I said, hey, come here a minute. I said, what's your problem? Why don't you shake my hand? This is what she said. This little girl did. She said, I don't like you. And she turned and walked out. And boy, I was, my blood was boiling by the end. The nerve of this little snotty-nosed little girl, about 12 years old. Amen. By the way, later we took them on a youth trip. I think it was after that. We caught her another girl in a little lesbian hookup. Yeah. yeah. That's where mom and daddy get you when they get out with the preacher and start staying at home and getting their preaching on TV. Yeah. So I told that lady when she came to call her mom, I said, listen, don't bring her back to this church anymore. That's what I told her. You said, preacher, now you can't do that. I did it. Yeah. Don't tell me what I can't do. I'll do it on purpose. 
I said, don't bring that little brat back here no more. She said, what'd she do? I said, she walked through the line. She won't never shake my hand, won't speak to me. I'll be friendly with anybody. But I said, she'd been acting weird. And when I asked her what was wrong, she said she didn't like me. I said, I don't appreciate that until her mom and daddy can come back and apologize and treat me with some respect. Just keep her somewhere else. Don't even bring her. That night she showed up with her. And she came walking in like this. Brother Ronnie, I'm sorry I said that this morning. I shouldn't have said that. Will you forgive me and let me keep coming? Sure I will. Don't worry about it. I was forgiven. And I dropped it and never said another word about it. Here's the point I'm making with that whole story. You know how that little girl didn't like me? I had not done one thing to her. But she heard mom and daddy sitting at the house, sitting back in the recliner with their feet propped up, drinking iced tea, talking about the preacher, dogging the preacher to death, putting me down like a dog because I preached the living hell out of them because they're living in sin, won't get right with God, won't go to church, won't pay their tithe, won't quit living like the devil. And I just kept bearing down and kept preaching. And so they sat and made me be the criminal. And I I'm the bad guy. And that's why that little girl didn't even like me and didn't know why. Amen. That's right. Sin can be infectious. It don't have to be. Sin can be inherited. I know we're all of Adam's race. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about the sin nature. I'm talking about your kids will follow. If you hate church and hate God, hate the preacher, your kids are going to be exactly like that. Someday you're going to need a man of God to come pray. Oh God, we need somebody to pray. Come and pray for us. We need you. And listen, them kids have heard you talk about the preacher so long, they won't want nobody to come pray for them. Listen what I heard a girl say one time. They tried to get her to come to the altar and get saved. She's in a youth meeting. People was getting saved left and right. She said, I don't want to get saved. I've heard all this talk about Jesus. And they said, well, it's all true. She said, yeah, that's what they told me about Santa Claus too. They took him away from me when I was about eight years old. And I don't believe in nothing y'all tell me. Well, she told her mom and daddy. Don't come preaching to me. She said, you told me about Santa Claus my whole life. Some of y'all teach your kids out. I'm sorry if I just busted your bubble. But I'm going to tell you something, brother. You know what she's saying? Hey, you pulled the rug out from me one time. I ain't going to believe you no more. Listen, brother, it does not have to be inherited. Sometimes the children will get a relationship with God and get born again. Hey, you don't have to inherit that sin that your mama and your daddy has done. Some of the best young people I've ever seen come from a messed up, broken messed up home and they get saved and get them a dose and they beg their parents and beg them and beg them and beg them to come to church and mom and daddy won't do it you say preach that's hard preaching if you show me one thing that I've said that's not in the word of God it's not the truth I'll eat your dirty socks but you know I'm right you know I'm telling the truth amen See, and it's not your destiny. You don't have to go down that road. Jesus passed by or you would have been the same infection of sin. If it wasn't for the grace of God, if it wasn't for the blood, if it wasn't for God's mercy, if it wasn't for God passing by your way, you'd be in the same shape. You'd have a wreck and ruin the messed up life that you couldn't do nothing with. Y'all heard me talk about my daddy all the time. And my mama, what good, godly people they were. They didn't grow up that way. Daddy's family wasn't bad people, but they just had no use for church. He come from a whole family, a whole slew of brothers and several sisters, all good people. I mean, they, what, they all worked, provided for the family as good people, just had no use for church. Daddy's daddy lived till he's 90 years old. And I don't ever remember seeing him in church, but just once or twice when he was staying with us, he'd, he'd hobble down to the church from the parsonage just because that's where he lived and he felt like he had to go once in a while. He never went to church, had no use for it. But my daddy broke that cycle, brother. My daddy decided if he got saved. Listen, they treated him like a weirdo. Every time we was at a family reunion or something, they all acted weird, treated daddy weird, treated us weird. We was all kind of, we was like a square peg in a round hole. You got to make up your mind which side you're going to line up on and how you're going to live your life and fool you on the rest of this world. Sin does not have to be infectious. It does not have to be inherited. Amen. My mama come from a same type family in West Virginia. Yeah, we got West Virginia roots. That explains a lot, don't it, Brother Amen. Jeff? That explains a lot. Amen. Preacher, we knew you was crazy. But none of mama's family ever went to church. Her mama, my grandma, I'd seen her in church later when she got old. She'd go to church on Sunday, dress up and wear a little hat and her white gloves and go to church. And other than that, she could care less. I'm serious. My own grandmother. 
Care less about church. Mama's brothers, mama's sisters. I never knew of any of them going to church. They always act like we had the plague. We was weirdos. They'd come to visit and they'd stay with us. They'd spend about a week with us on Sunday morning. You know what daddy done? All right, we're going to church. Saturday night, we're going to church in the morning. Everybody up, everybody out of the bed and out the door. Hey, you might be visiting. You might not go to church with us. But you ain't going to lay around my house and watch TV while I'm down at the church house preaching and got my kids in Sunday school. Get out of my house. You meet us back here after dinner. I'm telling you, that's what my, my daddy was. You ain't hanging around here. We go to church on Sunday. You go up the racetrack if you want to. You can come back and drop by for a visit. But we're all going down to God's house. None of my neighbors are going to see people out on the front porch sitting in a rocking chair drinking coffee on Sunday morning and ruin my reputation. He said, bless God, if you don't want to go to church, just get out and go somewhere else. Amen. That's the truth. Amen. And they got to where they'd get a motel when they'd come down. Amen. Daddy liked that even better. You don't have to feed them and clean up after them. Amen. The Bible said in Ezekiel 16, 44, as is the mother, so is her daughter. Amen? Amen? Bad women produce bad daughters, but you don't have to. Right. Trying to get people in church is hard because mama never went to church. Daddy never went to church. They never had a use for it. It's hard to get people to go to church. It, it don't have to be inherited or infectious. You say, well, preacher, you say, what about that? What about that verse that says that the, that the, the son shall bear the iniquity of the father? Let me tell you something. The Bible said this. He said, the son shall not what, say ye why doth not the son bear the iniquity of the father. When the son hath done that which is lawful and right and hath kept all my statutes and done them, he shall surely live. Amen. Open your Bible. I'll show you another one. I'll show you another one. Look at Exodus chapter number 20 real quick. Let's do a little Bible study this morning. Exodus chapter number 20. And keep your Bible open. Verse number 5. This is why. This is why. Now, the children do will be punished for what the daddy did. But here's the clause in it. Verse number 5. Chapter 20, verse 5. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the, under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Amen. Of them that hate me. Amen. If the kids happen to pull out and say, Daddy, I'm going to go to church. I love Jesus. God's judgment ain't going to be on them kids. Right. Look, at, read Ezekiel chapter 18. Go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter number 18. Amen. Everybody got your Bible? Yeah. All right. Let's do a little Bible study. Ezekiel chapter number 18. Ezekiel 18. Look at verse number 14. Now watch this. Now lo, if he beget a son that seeth all his father's sins, which he hath done, and consenteth, and do not such like, that hath not eaten up the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, hath not defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath oppressed any, hath not withholden the pledge, neither hath spoiled by violence, but hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment, that hath taken off his hand from the poor, that hath not... Receive usury nor increase, and executed my judgments, hath walked in my statutes. He shall not die for the iniquity of his father. He shall surely live. Listen to me. What I'm saying to you, if, if you follow, if you stay in that pattern and you live the same way your family lived, the judgment of God is against you. There's a curse against you. Amen. To begin with. But the Bible said there's an exception to that. Thank God if you stand for God, Jesus said there'll be father against son, mother against against daughter. That's exactly what he's talking about. This two-edged sword, it'll divide you as far along as are those spiritual lines. And brother, listen, God said if you'll stand for God and do what He said do, He won't punish you for what your father did. Amen. Kids grow up hating God. Hating church. I... Oh, listen to me. I want to tell you something, brother. I'd be ashamed unto the Lord. Amen. For my kids to grow up and never walk through a church door. You can realize there's people in this county and in this town that don't raise their kids according to what the Bible said. And them kids ain't going to know. They're going to be, listen, the Bible said they're without hope and without God. If you don't have God in your life and the Bible and the truth, you have no hope. There's no hope for you. They're going to grow up believing everything the world tells them and their mind's going to be clouded and shaped by the iniquity of this world and there's not going to be any hope for them unless mom and daddy brings them to the house of God. Unless the church can reach them. 
Amen? I know what I'm talking about. I've watched it happen. Sin does not have to be infectious. It does not have to be inherited. Number three, sin has to be individually accounted for. You might have grown up and lived. I don't know who this is for, and it don't matter. These messages go right straight in this building, and they go out over the airwaves, and thousands hear them. I'm telling you, if you live the life of degradation, debauchery, and destruction, hey, if you grow up that way, it don't have to stay that way. Hey, I've seen people, I've seen young people grow up in a terrible, terrible atmosphere, and, and God, by His mercy and grace, saves that young'un, and they serve God in mom and daddy never go to church. But there's a bus, there's a bus come by there one Saturday knocking on somebody's door. And that little toe-head uh, fella comes and preaches for him. He's just a little old boy. And he went out there and got on that bus and they took him to Sunday school and told him about Jesus. He heard some real preaching. I don't mean this Joel Osteen stuff. Make you feel good about yourself. You don't need to feel good about yourself. You need to realize you're a sinner and you're going to hell unless you repent of your sin. And boy, he got saved. He come back and he started telling his brothers, I'm going to church. I, I forget the name of it. It's something like Bible Baptist. Thank God they love me down there. I got saved. And it wasn't long till another one got saved. And then a little while later, another one got saved. And them boys turned out to be great men of God. They broke the cycle, brother. You can do it too. I heard Brother Rick Davis give his testimony about his daddy. His daddy grew up in that kind of atmosphere. I'm just trying to say, if you're here this morning and you're not saved, you're not just destined to stay lost. Because mama won't go to church and daddy won't go to church. Maybe it's time for you to break the cycle. Amen. Every individual has to account for themselves. Why did God reject Saul and he accepted David? They were both anointed by God. They were both appointed by God. They were both approved of God. Saul didn't repent, but David did. You say, I read over where Saul, Saul, uh, Saul repented, but the Bible said, 1 Samuel 15, 20, and Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the, obeyed the voice of the Lord. He denied his sin. That's not repentance. You don't come to a holy God and say, Lord, I hadn't really sinned but if you think I have, I'll accept it. No. That's false repentance. He said, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and brought again the king of Amalek and have utterly destroyed Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil. Are you listening to me? Saul said the people took of the spoil. God said, wipe everything out. But I obeyed God and I killed the king. And people, you know them church people are. Samuel told him you're going to lose the kingdom. Amen. First Samuel 15, 30 said, Then he said, I've sinned, yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders and before Israel. And he, he worshiped, but he said, He repented and said, Honor me before the elders and the people. Make me look good. You understand what I'm saying? The Bible said there's two kinds of repentance. The Bible said there's a, there's a godly repentance. And the Bible said there's a worldly repentance. That's where you got sorry, you're sorry for getting caught. Hey, when it's a godly repentance, you come to God and say, God, I'm sorry, for, not for what I did, but for what I am. I'm a hellbound sinner. Lord, I deserve every bit of it. I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against God. I've sinned against His righteousness and holiness. I've sinned against the truth. Of the Word of God. I'm a sinner, Lord. I know I'm lost. I know I'm condemned. I'm found guilty. I ought to go into hell. You should throw me in hell because I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. God will forgive those kind every single time. But when you come to the altar because you got caught, I just, uh, man, one woman come to church one time, and they come a couple times, and, and uh, they want to talk to me. So I went in my office a minute, and he said, he said, we want to get married. So we're living together. We know that's not right. We want to get married. I said, well, I don't just marry people because I can. First thing y'all need to do is come apart. Y'all separate for a while. And he come to church a while. Let's see if this thing's real. You know, I knew what he said. And then he said, well, we're trying to rent this trailer. And the landlord won't let nobody live there that's shacking up. I said, good for him. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I said, not only that. I said, I don't marry people that don't belong to my church. And I don't marry people that ain't saved. He said, he, she said, well, I'm saved. He said, I'm not, but I'll go ahead and get saved. I said, look, Jack, it don't work like that. 
You gonna come out this all and repeat some little old uh, man-made sinner's prayer, or you gonna you gonna repeat a prayer after me, and then I'm gonna parade you down the aisle and marry? I said, no, it don't work that way. You gotta get saved because you're sorry of your sin, and you're going to hell, not just so you can get a while, so you can rent a house at a good cheaper rate. Amen. I said, no, I ain't doing. It. I said, out and wait. And Debbie spoke up. She said. Best thing y'all do is leave him out of this and go down to justice of peace if you're determined to get married. We never saw him again. Amen. If their heart would have been right and they'd have really been genuine and said, Preacher, we're living in sin. Oh God, we know this ain't right. You know what they'd have done? They'd have done exactly what I told them to do. Y'all come apart and let's just pray about this. Let's give it a couple of months. Hey, you ain't gonna die. You can live without her. He can live without you. You'll survive it if you're really serious about it. Amen. If you really mean business. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's hard preaching, ain't it? Preacher, that's hard to swallow. Do you realize how many people's got a common law wife? Do you realize God does not honor common law marriages? Amen. Ain't it funny that people claim to be Christian and go to church and won't get married and the queers are fighting to get it so they can? That's backwards. That's crazy. The homosexuals are fighting to get married and people claim to get, be Christians won't. Go to church and shack up, y'all be ashamed of yourself. How do you pray at night? I don't know this before. I don't even care. How do you pray at night? How do you open your Bible knowing you're shacking up, living in adultery? That's wicked as hell itself. That's wicked. I know a lot of preachers don't preach on that because afraid he'll hurt people's feelings. I'm beyond that. I growed out of that a long time ago. I don't care. Listen, brother, right is right and wrong is wrong. Whether you're stealing from God and you're tithing or whether you're shacking up or you're drinking or whatever it might be, if you want to be right with God, you'll abide by His laws. Amen. That's right. You don't have to spend your life in your past. You can bring, break that cycle. You can, you can live right and serve God. What about them preacher boys I just mentioned? I mean, they're successful preachers. Soul winners. I mean, I mean, you get on, the, on their website and look. Man, you ought to hear the youth choir up there. My soul, have mercy. I mean, brother, you think, dear, dear God, Lord, don't use that old boy. And you ought to hear some of the... Kids grow up watching mamas and daddies go through different lovers. Watch them going into jail and back out of jail. Watching their health fall apart. Watching their teeth fall out. Watching them age overnight because they won't leave drugs alone. Because daddy and mama won't work and love on each other and raise kids right the way God intended to be. And they grow up and they ain't got a snowball chance in hell hardly of getting saved unless somebody goes out of a Bible believing Bible preaching church like this and says, hey! I want to throw out the lifeline. I want to reach somebody for Jesus. Hey, let's not let them kids go to hell. Let's not let them young people go to hell. Let's keep up the fight. Keep waving that bloodstained banner. You realize this morning, those of you that saved and your kids are saved and serving God, and your grandkids are serving God, you're so blessed you don't even know it. You're so blessed you don't even realize it. We're spoiled. That's what's wrong with us. We're spoiled. We got an automatic world. We don't realize you see them girls standing up here on the front row singing in the choir and, the, and Candace playing the bass and young man running sound in the sound room. My God, you know how rare that is? You know what most teenagers are doing? They're smoking dope, taking pills, drinking liquor, and they're sleeping with everybody they can, ruining their health, ruining their mind, and throwing their soul down the drain to the devil. Well, I thank God every day we ought to encourage them. We ought to shake their hand, hug their neck once in a while, and say, I'm proud of you. You're my hero. My hero ain't LeBron James or Michael Jordan. My hero is these kind of young people that stand for God, love Jesus, carry a pocket full of tracks to school, and take a stand against this ungodly world. It's wicked out there now, people. Amen. It ain't a game no more. Amen. I mean, when we was kids in the 70s, the worst thing ever happened. We'd sneak out behind Jim, get in a fight, or sneak behind Jim and smoke one. That was it. Amen. Girls didn't get pregnant. We didn't have pregnant girls at graduation, none of that stuff. I'm not making this up. Back in the 70s, Amen. we thought it was a wild time then. These kids face opposition that mean you never dreamed of. Amen. They go to school with boys who change their gender overnight and come back as a girl. They go to school with a girl who comes back the next day and claims she's a boy. They go to school where the teacher stands up and says, Now kids, you need to take a sensitivity class because these homosexuals, if they decide they want to be gay, there's nothing you can do about it. I want to tell you something, folks. Our kids are facing the pure old devil by the half acre 
pastor out there in the public school. They're facing, the fact they're even hanging in there is amazing to me. With the world pulling at them like it is. Everywhere they turn, everything they listen to on the radio, everything comes on that blessed television. It's popped out of hell and it's pulling at our young people, pulling at our families, pulling at these kids, trying to ruin them before they ever get a shot at a real life. Amen. I'll tell you something, young people, this is the real life. Some of you young people that's married and got kids, uh, Miss Tiffany and Jesse and Ronnie and Jessica and Travis and Lauren, all these young couples that starting new families. Thank God for young people. I'm telling you, this wasn't in my message, but thank God for these young adults and Gunner and Ryan going to school and Emma trying to get in a good college and serve God. My God, people, I want to tell you something, the rest of the world is going to hell without God. All, not just our church. There's other churches around. We've got young people. We need to hold them up to God. Say, Lord, let these kids break this cycle in their family. Amen. Amen. By the way, Christians don't drink liquor and smoke pot. Amen. Amen. I don't care what you've been told. It's a sin. Amen. The Bible said, whosoever is deceived, strong drink, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Hey, listen, they're arguing about pot and legalizing marijuana, and in the same breath, they act like drinking is okay. You know, drinking takes more people, takes more people's lives than all the illegal drugs put together. Did you know alcohol has ruined more lives than it's it's cost more death than all the wars America has fought combined. Amen. Since the revolution, liquor and beer and wine. You can't watch a ball game. You can't watch nothing. You can't watch a movie, an old movie, black and white, and they're having a drink. Would you like a drink? Sure, I'll have a drink. Let's have a drink. Let's go have a drink. Man, I got drunk. How about you? Let's drink, 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 drink. Society is programmed to the thing. Oh, it's kids, war on drugs. Just say no to drugs. Just go get your six pack and drink and everything will be okay. You're out of your ever-loving mind. That's as wicked as it can be. It'll ruin their lives. It'll ruin their families. It'll ruin their bodies. Amen. Break the cycle, kids. God can and will deliver you from that family sin. I've heard people say, well, preacher, I did those kind of things too. So, Did you hear what I just said? It's a different world. Besides, you just got lucky. And I just got lucky. I don't believe in luck. It was just the providence of God. Come on the piano, Ron. I feel like I'm preaching another hour. It was just the mercy of God that got you in. Don't have that attitude. Hey, if you got that attitude, are you prepared to go down to the local jail? Are you prepared to drive to the prison to visit your son once a month? Hey, are you are you prepared to raise children that your your daughter doesn't even know who the daddy is? Hey, I know people's life in that shape, and God will help you put your life back together. But parents and grandparents, we ought to have the attitude: God spare our kids, help them, Lord Jesus, to stay right, stay right with God, stay with the church. Don't rebel. Against Against authority. And this whole story started out with some men that came before the preacher. We don't like your attitude, preacher. You think you know everything. We know as much as you do. And Moses, being a good pastor like he was, it broke his heart and he began to pray. And Moses put him to the test. He said, Okay, if God chose me, then we'll see tomorrow. If God chose you, the earth's going to swallow you up. Can I tell you this? Everybody I've ever seen rebel against authority has trouble. Amen. Even in the natural life. You know, all these riots and stuff burning down Baltimore and Ferguson and all that. They don't accomplish nothing by doing that. That ain't the way you, that ain't the way you correct problems by burning down your city and looting and mugging and killing and all that stuff. Rebelling against authority never works. The Bible said be subject to the powers. They're ordained of God. And every church that I've ever seen where anybody fought against the preacher and the leadership of a church, bad things happen. Hey, if you can't live with a preacher and you don't like him, he's doing something wrong, just quietly leave him and go somewhere else. Just leave him alone. Let God... Hey, we raised our kids with a belt and a Bible, but you wasn't going to whip them. They ain't a man in here big enough to whip my kids. If they need to whip it, ask them if daddy didn't give it to them and mama didn't give it to them. 
Hey, there ain't none of you wanting nobody else to whip your kids. God's the same way. God's in charge of his pastor. He put him in a church and gave him that assignment. He don't need you correcting him. He don't need you to straighten him out. He don't need you to call him in the office and, and tell him this is what we want to do and this is what we ain't going to do. You're going to get in the way of God. And when I say bad things happen, I'm not talking about somebody getting the flu. I'm talking about graveyard stuff. That's not what I was talking about a while ago either. It's a different context. And I've never, every time anybody's ever done that, I always embrace myself. And I, me and Debbie pray for them because I know it's coming. I know it's coming. Every time people do those kind of things and start running, listen, you're, you say, preacher, are you preaching to us? Hey, if it hits you, I am. But you start getting in the way of God's business and start trying to run the preacher. If you'll read that in its context, God said you fought against God. Now, y'all know where I stand about Obama. I don't like him. I can't wait till we get somebody else in. But I don't want some terrorist going in the White House and killing him. That's, that's our White House. That's our that's Washington DC. That's American soil. You see what I'm saying? I wouldn't want some I wouldn't want some Muslim terrorist to drop in there and kill him. I'd be ready to fight. You understand you understand the concept I'm trying to get at? So when you rebel against authority, rebel against the man of God, bad things. God said this. He said, Touch not mine anointed. Do my prophets no harm. Amen. You can break the cycle this morning. I preached longer than I normally do. I thought this would be a 20 minute message, but I guess the Lord had other plans. If you're here this morning, you're not saved. Maybe you're saved, you just ain't right with God. I'm telling you, if you live the sinful life, live out there in sin, you always reap what you sow. You're gonna, if you throw corn out, you're not going to reap tomatoes. If you live that rough life, you're going to live a short life and you ain't going to be happy. You'll never have peace. Come to this altar this morning. Break that cycle. Say, preacher, I want to sell out to God. I want to serve God. I don't want to live like I've seen others live in my family. I want to do what's right. God will honor you. God will bless you. He'll spare you. Let's stand this morning.